This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. From Philadelphia to Erie and from Scranton to Pittsburgh, it's Behind the Headlines. Hi, I'm Charlie Greenewald, Senior Fellow of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy, and I'm joined as usual by my co-host, Maura Donnelly, who's on location in Mechanicsburg, right, Maura? That's exactly where I am, Charlie. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Why, uh, we are, of course, uh, continuing during uh, this turbulent time uh, to consider the issues of climate change and of energy and energy self-sufficiency. And uh, therefore, we decided that what better guest to have with us than uh, Rachel Gleason, who is the executive director of the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance. Welcome to the show, Rachel. Thanks for having me, Charlie. Ah, uh, you're very, very welcome. Could you give our viewers just a snapshot, please, of your organization, the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance, and a little bit about uh, you, uh, so uh, uh, we come up to speed. Sure. Um, the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance is a, um, we have about 200 member companies, close to 200 member companies, and we represent the bituminous coal operators in Pennsylvania, in addition to the manufacturing and service providers in Pennsylvania that support the mines. So not only um, the mines that produce the coal and extract the coal, but also, you know, larger companies, the environmental firms, the machinists, um, the geologists, the hydrologists, everything that supports um, our industry in Pennsylvania. We are the third largest coal producing state in the nation, which a lot of folks east of the Susquehanna don't really realize. But if you go out west, we have quite a footprint in about 22, 25 different counties. Um, we are a huge contributor to Pennsylvania's economy. We contribute over $4 billion a year in economic impact and have um, employ about 18,000 jobs directly and indirectly. Um, about myself, I started with the Coal Alliance in 2014. Prior to that, um, I kind of grew up in the General Assembly, worked in the private sector a little bit, started as, um, as regulatory affairs manager for the Coal Alliance in 14, and then with some changes in leadership, um, fell into my current position in about 2016. Congratulations, I think. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the issues we want to talk to you about today, or the issue we want to talk to you about, is uh, affectionately referred to as REGI, which is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And I think a lot of people are hearing about this, but I, I think they have no idea what it is, what it means, and why it's important or um, troublesome Pennsylvania. So can you tell us a little bit about Reggie? Yes, in this scenario, Reggie is not a person. Yes. <laughs> it is the regional, <laughs> regional greenhouse. No, we need to know that. <laughs> yeah, it's the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. It is a interstate compact between um, about 10 states, primarily New England. Um, New Jersey joined in, uh, so as by way of background, Reggie was first thought of, um, it was kind of born in 2005, but it did not take effect until 2009. Um, it's about 10 states, all of New England, so we're talking Maine, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Vermont, Rhode Island, New York, um, New Jersey joined and then left, and now they're back in. Um, Maryland and Delaware participate, and Virginia is slated to join. Um, what Reggie is, it's a, um, it's, it's a multi-state compact, and they tax fossil fuel generation, so essentially, Via, via requiring the purchasing of allowances, um, that generation is taxed, and that goes on coal, natural gas, and oil that makes any kind of electricity. Um, quarterly auctions are held to determine the amount of price adder or tax that the generators would have to pay, and then over time, uh, that amount decreases in an effect to shutter that fossil fuel generation. Um, in Pennsylvania, what the governor is proposing, well, what the governor, and I might be getting ahead of myself, um, ordered with his executive order last October, has resulted in impacting electric generating units, so natural gas, coal, oil, that um, create over 25 megawatts of, of nameplate, have over 25 megawatts of nameplate capacity, and send um, more than 10% of their generation to the grid. 
So uh, where, what's Pennsylvania's status? Have we joined? Are we part of it? Are we looking at it? We have not joined um there there's a there's a lot of moving parts um first pennsylvania's regulatory process if you're familiar with it all is quite complicated um so the the governor signed the executive order last october that executive order ordered the department of environmental protection to develop regulations um essentially joining pennsylvania to reggie there was um some conversation since then if, if we were going to have an inter or intra state program, but DEP has since come out with the regulations that they're proposing and they want to join Reggie. Um, so that process, I think the initial proposed draft went to the Air Quality Technical Advisory Committee in like January or February. Um, and since then, they have presented it to the Air Quality Technical Advisory Committee and the Citizens Advisory Council for their recommendations. Um, which we can get into later, but neither committee uh, voted to move the regulation forward. Um, but the governor's executive order has a July um, 31st end date for those regulations. And I think he still plans as of today, um, giving that regulation to the Environmental Quality Board, which is the first step in a proposed reg um, for recommendation. Well, Rachel, you said that you are a child of the uh, legislature, and so was I uh, for many, many years. Uh, my question to you would be, um, what is the um, consensus, or is there a consensus, on Capitol Hill in Harrisburg regarding uh, this executive order? And the legislature can clearly um, uh, pass a statute that will override whatever executive orders he may want to issue, uh, is there uh, any movement uh, in that uh, direction? Um, well, Charlie, I would say that I don't believe there is a consensus that the governor has the legal authority to join an interstate compact or impose a tax without General Assembly approval. Uh -huh. um, aside from that, he, he seems to be going full steam ahead with this process. Um, there are two bills, Senate Bill 950 and House Bill 2025, that were introduced in those respective chambers that pretty much, not pretty much, they do um, delineate a process for which if the governor, um, if, if the governor wants to develop regulations, according to the Air Pollution Control Act, he can develop them, but they have to be for submittal to the General Assembly. Um, those two bills address a process in which if it comes to that point, um, a process for public hearings, public comments, involvement, you know, identifying generators that will no longer be able to operate because it won't be economical, a, a more of a public process that during this COVID pandemic especially, we have not been able to have. Laura? So there are a lot of, um, you're not alone in terms <laughs> of uh, your distaste for Reggie at this point. Um, you know, and Harrisburg's big on building coalitions. Is there a coalition forming to be prepared for this? Or um, can, you know, do, do you want to mention a couple other groups that might be with you on this? Or, you know, how is that working in terms of getting the word out about this? Sure. Well, getting the word out has been a little bit difficult given everything's COVID, COVID, COVID every day. Um, but yes, there was a coalition formed earlier this year called the Power PA Jobs Alliance. Um, and there's quite a number of members. It's a, a very strong union presence. We have um, support from the Boilermakers, IBEW, AFL-CIO, um, in addition to folks like the Pennsylvania Manufacturers, the NFIB, the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance, um, the generators, the railroads. Um, you know, when you take coal to a, to a power plant, it doesn't always go by river. In Pennsylvania, it goes by rail or truck. So, you know, there's a lot of industries that are directly impacted by um, the closure of, anticipated closure of power plants should Pennsylvania join Reggie. Well, Rachel, how many uh, coal-fired uh, electricity plants are there in Pennsylvania and how much Pennsylvania uh, mined coal is used in those plants? Um, we have five traditional coal-fired electric generating units in Pennsylvania left. Um, since deregulation in 1996, I believe that the numbers around 19 have closed. So we only have five left. 
Um, there are three very large ones in Indiana and Armstrong County. That's Keystone, Connemaw, and Homer City. There's another one in Cheswick um, in Pittsburgh and another one um, in Montour County called Talon um, and one in York County, which is Brunner Island. Um, as you may know, Bruce Mansfield's First Energy, which is now, which was First Energy Solutions, which is now Energy Harbor, closed their Bruce Mansfield plant um, this past year, so we are down to five. Uh, as far as the coal that goes to those plants, and I can get a little in the weeds on this, but um, we have about nine million tons of our production goes to those plants. And it's very interesting when you look at the river system and where plants are located and how coal gets there. Um, if those plants were to close, then that coal would have to go elsewhere and flood markets that are already flooded. So um, the, the direct line that we have to a lot of our, to our remaining plants um, is about a third, a third or a fourth of our um, annual production. Um, that said, and not to get too nerdy on coal, but we have um, thermal coal and met coal. So only thermal coal goes to those power plants. So um, I, know, I know a couple of other states have really looked at this very thoroughly and have done some economic analysis work on it. Does Pennsylvania, has Pennsylvania done an economic analysis? Have they determined what the impact would be? No, the governor in his ex executive order um, asked for a robust public outreach. Um, and part of the regulatory process, there's supposed to be an economic analysis, um, that has not been done. So, you know, part of REGI, it, it creates revenues from taxing the generation and the department um, under what they are trying to do, which again, it, legally, we don't even know, know that we, they can do it, um, is using the Air Pollution Control Act. And therefore, they can only put the funds into the Clean Air Fund and that can only go towards certain projects. So there's no effort to help with displaced workers. There's no um, analysis of the economies of, you know, what the mom and pop shop down the street from this major power plant is going to face, what some of the school districts are going to face. We had a virtual press conference a couple weeks ago, and some of the school districts in Indiana County were just devastated. I mean, they, they would think that they would have to shut down and merge with someone else because this would be, you know, 30% of their operating budget comes from the taxes paid by these power plants. So there's been no real economic analysis on the schools, on the, the local impact, the county impact, or the jobs um, that will be lost with the um, proposed implementation of joining Pennsylvania to Reggie. Do you the, think there's any in the last, oh, Go ahead, Charlie. Oh, I was just going to say in the last 30 seconds, uh, could you tell us if you think these uh, projections will be forthcoming anytime soon? Um, I do not know. Um, that's something the, the, the department paid for modeling to be done on um, a, a policy, what they call a policy and a reference case on, you know, emission reduction, and what they think will happen, but they have not come forth with any kind of economic modeling. Um, I know that was requested by both the Air Quality Technical Advisory Committee that did not propose to um, forward the proposed regulation. And I, a large reason of that is because the impact, devastation that would have in a lot of these Western Pennsylvania communities. Okay, well, thank you very much, Rachel, for being with Mara and myself this morning. Uh, we can't thank you enough. Uh, we uh, and our viewers need to keep our eyes on Reggie and what happens and uh, what effect it, it could possibly have on our communities. Thank you very much. We look forward to having you back. Thank you both, anytime. Thanks, Rachel. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back with a second a segment of Behind the Headlines right after this. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Pennsylvania State Association of Township Supervisors, the largest, most influential municipal association in the Commonwealth. Since 1921, PSATS has been preserving and strengthening township government and securing greater visibility and involvement for townships in the state and federal political arenas. Covering 95% of Pennsylvania's land mass, townships represent 5.5 million residents, more than any other type of political subdivision in Pennsylvania. Behind the Headlines is also brought to you by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, helping hospitals provide healing, health, and hope to communities across the state. And by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. The Pennsylvania Chamber serves as the frontline advocate for business on Pennsylvania's Capitol Hill by influencing the legislative, regulatory, and judicial branches of state government. 
Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. By the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Visit pahighwayinfo.org. Hi, this is Charlie Greenwald. Welcome back to Behind the Headlines. Mara Donnelly and I are joined for this segment by Robert Latham, who is the Executive Vice President of the Associated Pennsylvania Constructors. Uh, Bob, welcome back to the show. Uh, uh, thank you, Charlie. Hi, Mara. This is the first time that we've ever uh, uh, been together where we were not in the same Where we haven't been together. Video. Where are you uh, broadcasting from, Bob? Well, uh, fortunately, uh, our offices are in a green county, so we are able to, uh, we're able to be there. So the background there is actually my office uh, in Harris. Okay. I'm going to let Mara start off with the uh, questioning today because uh, there's certainly uh, uh, no shortage of uh, issues uh, to uh, examine uh, when we're looking at uh, the highway uh, industry and uh, the pandemic. Uh, Mara, why don't you uh, take, it from, take, take it from here? Hello, Bob. It's great to see you again. I, I know Mara. that the highway construction industry was dramatically impacted by COVID-19 and that um, it was really a tough situation for a lot of your members at APC. And yep. can you tell us a little bit about what, um, what they went through during this time frame, and maybe bring us up to speed about where they are now? Sure. Um, we, Pennsylvania became one of only three states that ever actually closed down highway construction. Uh, at the very beginning of the uh, COVID-19 um, uh, stay-at-home order. And uh, so that was particularly difficult. We had, uh, you know, more so for uh, the folks that work on highways and bridges uh, and the uncertainty in their lives uh, than the owners of companies, so to speak. Uh, one thing I will say is that uh, we had an immediate partnership with PennDOT and the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission engineering staffs uh, we worked through a uh, significant and very inclusive uh, procedure uh, preparing for restart uh, and preparing our projects for restart so that they could be safe in, in, the, uh, in the new uh, COVID environment. And uh, uh, yeah, after six weeks, the uh, slow rollout, um, we were all back to, back to start up on, on May the 1st. Um, so I think the, you know, the industry is, is fully back to work. Uh, we're working, you know, we're working through things. Uh, one of the things, you know, I think that's important to understand is that uh, contractors have uh, uh, a solid commitment uh, to safety, uh, more so than, you know, safety is the paramount issue on our jobs. Um, that's why we've been on here many, many times talking about work zone safety and slowing motorists through work zones. Uh, uh, and that uh, goes to the COVID issue as well. And we have a very extensive safety process there. Well, so there could not have been a safer time to be uh, working on the roads than during COVID-19 because nobody was, nobody was driving. So, well, yeah, unfortunately, during the slowdown, we were shut down. But uh, exactly. you know, it's kind of water under the dam at this point. Uh, uh, what we're hoping to see is throughout the summer uh, that uh, we will be able to work with, uh, the, with PennDOT. We'll be able to work with the Turnpike Commission. Um, and accelerate some of these projects, um, take advantage of good weather. Hopefully we'll have a good, you know, we'll have a good weather summer. Uh, we'll catch up uh, and we'll minimize cost of this uh, shutdown, the, minimize the cost that the shutdown has uh, imposed upon the industry and will ultimately be passed on to con uh, consumers. Well, Bob, all industries have different um, uh, tactics and techniques that they have to use uh, when reopening to uh, keep their employees safe from this pandemic. What are specifically some of the strategies that have to be used uh, by your organization out on the highways? Well, uh, of course we have in, uh, on all these projects, there is a, there's a project trailer, I guess, if you will, a project office. Uh, so we have implemented very strict cleaning provisions for the project offices um, on, a, on a daily basis. 
uh, we have signage, uh, we have restrictions on uh, people entering those uh, project offices. They must have masks. Um, our companies also have very strict procedures in monitoring the health of their employees. Uh, so there is uh, there is uh, temperature um, uh, checking. Uh, there is uh, uh, you know again a whole procedure if it, if an employee tests positive or or is sick and how that how that is handled uh, out on the job sites. Um, uh, when we have we engage in social distancing, I mean one of the things we do have going for us is you know we're outside. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the operations are far away, or you have an individual, uh, uh, a woman or a gentleman, uh, operating a piece of equipment uh, in a cab, usually by themselves. So there's uh, there's isolation there. Uh, we have procedures for for close-in operations, uh, like uh, a bridge structure construction, where you kind of have to get in there with one another, but you know, that involves mass face shields and things like that of that nature. So uh, it has been very extensive. Um, uh, but, but you know, contractors uh, are used to overcoming things and, uh, and we got back to it very quickly. Well, I'm going to confess that I, I may have snuck out of my Yellow County um, and paid turnpike tolls to uh, support the industry. Um, <laughs> while we were yellow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I'm not sure our viewers um, really understand the financial impact that the pandemic had on um, funding of construction and just funding in general. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, what we've seen uh, on, of course, uh, hi highways through, you know, through agencies like PennDOT, are funded primarily through the fuels tax, uh, registration fees, and that sort of thing. Uh, so we've seen about a $150 million, $160 million drop in funding for PennDOT uh, for April and May. We're hoping to see a rebound here uh, as a result of people driving. Uh, harder hit, more hardly, more impacted uh, was the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission because the, uh, you know, the drop in driving is all on tolls and, uh, and really, really put a crimp in their finances. Uh, uh, enter into that, you know, for the, for uh, ever since 2007, uh, Act 44 has imposed about a $400 million uh, shift, if you will, of, uh, of toll revenue uh, to support uh, uh, PennDOT multimodal funds and also public transit, the public transit assistance fund in, uh, in the Pennsylvania general fund. So, you know, I'll, I'll go back there. So you pay tolls to the turnpike, they in turn take take that money. They buy bonds with it. They sell the bond pro the bond proceeds are then shifted to PennDOT, and then uh, that goes over to the general fund in order to, to pay for public transit. Uh, that schematic expires in 2022, uh, but it's also something that we think is unsustainable, and we're seeing it as unsustainable because now, uh, because of this uh, slowdown in revenue uh, from from tolls, the turnpike is not able to make their bond payment. Uh, for July. So they've been, uh, when I say not able to make it, that means that they've been granted a, you know, a grace period, an extension, sort of like uh, uh, you've seen with the uh, CARES Act uh, uh, for uh, legislation allowing people to defer mortgage payments and things like that, things of that nature. So, so um, we just have, we've had extensive conversations with the uh, with PennDOT officials and other officials, they are very confident that that this extent, this time extension, if you will, of the PennDOT's payment of the Turnpike's payment to PennDOT uh, will not disrupt anything uh, in the near term. But the longer that it goes, the longer that it goes, it could have a, a severe impact on on public transit and, and other what we call multimodal funds. That support for Amtrak, support for uh, bicycle and uh, pedestrian facilities, and other things like uh, things of that nature. Uh, on the highway side, uh, you know, there's, there's a little bit of wrestling going on between the independent fiscal office and the Department of Revenue as to how extensive uh, this impact will be on, you know, sort of that, that, that PennDOT uh, issue. And uh, you know, IFO says uh, not so much. Revenue says much greater. And I think we're sort of in this hole. We don't know at this point. It's, it, it's, really, hard to, it's really hard to say. Well, Bob, going back to the safety protocols, uh, you, uh, you and your, your organization works with the Turnpike, your organization uh, works with PennDOT uh, and other um, contractors, I imagine. 
do, does every organization have the same uh, conception of what social distancing is, of uh, what the safety uh, protocols should be, Bob? How do you uh, mesh all these uh, different organizations together uh, so they can work together? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I'm happy to say that in terms of getting our industry up to speed on, on our safety plans, uh, we've had uh, the Turnpike Commission and PennDOT in the room uh, with, our, with, our, with representatives of our industry, also representatives of the uh, consulting uh, design community that uh, would allow them to, uh, to coordinate all of that. Um, and um, so, so, you know, we're all sort of on the same page there. I would say the, uh, uh, the challenge has been to uh, look at all of the various regulatory agencies and make sure that, you know, we're all in agreement on what we're doing there. So you have, you have the CDC, you have the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, you have the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry, uh, but you know, over and above all of those now is the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Uh, there is guidance issued for general construction, uh, which is really gets more to residential and commercial construction, but some of that spills over into, in, in, into, into us as well. Um, what we've done is we've really uh, focused in on the Pennsylvania Department of Health guidelines and the CDC. Uh, I think everybody, you know, everybody at the Department of Transportation and uh, and the uh, Turnpike Commission agrees with that approach. Uh, so we've been we've been able to get navigate those uh, those waters, so to speak, Charlie. And uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, took a lot of there were a lot. A lot of these uh, Zoom meetings that went on until, you know, into, into the wee hours of the night, or at least into like, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night. And I gotta, I gotta, I gotta really uh, uh, take our hat off to, to our public officials, particularly at PennDOT and the Turnpike Commission. Uh, you know, they worked very, they worked very long and hard and, and worked, uh, worked hand in hand with us to try to put this back together again. And, and, and I gotta give them credit. Uh, um, we're working in a very good partnership with them, uh, and those those two agencies are to be commended. Well, Bob, <laughs> this is the same thing that happens to Mara and I all the time. We're out of time. Uh, we need you to come back and give us uh, an update soon, but we did want to check in with you during the course of this pandemic and see how uh, highway construction was uh, being dealt with. Uh, we thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate it very much, and hopefully we'll have some good financial news later on. All right, and we hope you'll be with us again next week for another episode of Behind the Headlines. See you then.